Hello and welcome to a series of interviews I will be doing with councillors across the county to find out what they do and how they go about their job and things that are happening within your local area with your councillor. Today in this first interview I'm very pleased to be joined by councillor Alex Williams, representative of Pemprisk and the new opposition leader of the council. How are you Alex? Very well thanks, how are you? I'm great, thank you, and thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks we'll for inviting me to how, the interview. See how this all goes. So you've been a councillor for a while now. You've been, you've done other councillors. You're coming to the end of your tenure, so to speak, with an election next year. Um, may I ask what got you into councilling or to be a representative for a councillor or working for the community? Yeah, well, I think I stood for election first in about 2008. So I've been in um, politics for quite some time now, and I've always been interested in politics. But um, I was first elected onto Pencoy Town Council in um, 2008 um, as a Conservative representative then in uh, the Valindra Ward, um, but lost out then to Mike Gregory, who was um, Janice Gregory's husband, the former um, member of the Assembly for the County Council seat. Um, and then, of course, um, in 2017, I was elected as um, the uh, representative for Pemprisk. So I've been around around the block uh, quite a bit, to be honest. Yeah. So was this an ambition you always had to be in public life, uh, to suffer sometimes abuse and sometimes praise <laughs> as, as we all get as councillors well, hopefully hopefully more praise than abuse to be honest but uh, yeah well you know i was always interested in politics um from quite a young age to be honest um i um watched it closely as a teenager um when tony blair actually became prime minister he appointed my my father's brother my uncle as um his attorney attorney general um and uh, I was obviously fascinated with that. And um, my uncle Gareth um, became uh, leader of the House of Lords at some point. So there was always pop politics in the family, not necessarily my party politics, but um, yeah, certainly, certainly politics in the family, which um, caused uh, quite, a li quite a bit of debate. Um, I then studied politics at university when I went to Bath and then uh, went on to do a master's uh, in politics at Bath. So it's, it's always been a, a big interest of mine. Um, I don't really know why I became a conservative, to be honest with you. It's not out of any specific ideology, as I think I probably sit sort of somewhere in the centre of uh, politics, you know, perhaps more of a liberal, to be honest with you. Uh, but, um, I, you know, as a young man, I quite like the uh, challenging nature of opposition. Um, you know, for example, you know, I was a liberal supporter my fa because my father supported Everton. No, and I probably joined the Conservative Party because that, my father was a socialist and, you know, we like the debate at home, uh, you know, the, the challenge of debate. Uh, and, you know, to be honest with you, I was also liking the, the kind of politics that David Cameron was advocating at the time. So that was probably why I joined the Conservatives. Um, but I suppose now I'm a little bit older. I've realised, you know, that opposition is quite an easy place to be sometimes. It's very easy to criticise, isn't it? And I suppose it's quite important to propose innovative alternatives, and that's what I want to try and do now, but as well as providing robust challenge to the, the existing administration. So it's about being, I suppose, pragmatic and supportive where appropriate. And this is the kind of opposition that I'd like to sort of provide. Um, it's, it's, it's about also working in partnership with your opponents to improve the lives of the people who you represent. So, you know, sometimes I think politics in Bridgend and other places can be a little bit too toxic sometimes. And, um, you know, that I think is where people in the community are, are, are a little bit turned off by it. So th there's room, I suppose, to be courteous, challenging, work in partnership, all at the same time and it's that fine balance which we need to try and uh, uh, try and find sometimes yeah um that's right you don't it's not bad having opposition because then you can find the middle ground that works for hmm. the most people in in respect and i completely agree with politics especially in bridge end over the last five years now has been very toxic but i suppose that's what comes with the advent of um social media and 
Twitter and things like that, people will voice their opinions more. But it, yeah, does, sure. it does have that uh, thing of turning off the ordinary people who just are not really interested in politics, but are interested in what's going on within the county to make life easier. Yeah, it better, tends to be... It tends to be a sort of a political bubble kind of thing, doesn't it? You know, and yeah. that's where it turns off the majority of residents. Um, you know, I suppose from my perspective as a as the leader of the largest opposition group, you know, call me leader of the opposition, but I suppose that's a you know um, putting me above my pay grade. It's um, I suppose leader of the largest group. So I try to work with partners across the council, including the administration, to try and find that uh, balanced uh, ground. Um, but also providing that robust challenge which the administration needs. So, yeah, that's um, that's, the, that's the kind of opposition which I'd like to create anyway. Yeah, it, it, it's not a case of everybody's fighting against each. I I don't blame one one side particularly because we know, all know what's going on in Bridge End with the various groups and that. Um, yeah, bit. I'm part of one of those groups. I'm a councillor for Lichard Ward in for Coity High Community Council representing I am affiliated with uh, Bridgend County Independence and we have yeah. been accused of toxic thing. That's not me. Uh, yes, I have sometimes myself criticised and you do that, but it's normally in response to overt criticism of somebody else. I'd rather everybody, yes, not agree on everything because that's when everything gets boring and stale and nothing improves. That you work together and say well that's not a great thing we don't think it should be done this way let's look at this way and see if we can find a middle ground between the two that works both ways and that's how yeah as long as it as long as, long as it's constructive isn't it and you know, otherwise yeah. it, it kind of descends into sort of personality politics which is exactly what we don't want really no it comes into personal attacks and that's the bad thing part about politics from the lowest level of community council all the way up to parliament to westminster to america as you see now which is it's more like watching the west wing than actually proper <laughs> yeah, well, politics re remarkably i i think sometimes and you know you probably asked me a little bit about my um, history as a community um or town and community councillor later but the um remarkably i find that the lower level of local government that you have the more political it, it can actually be, amazingly. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that is that is strange in some respects. You'd expect it to be a bit more uh, collegiate, I suppose, at um, town and community level and for the community, but it often um, often isn't the case. No, I, th I, th I think with that, when the c th that case comes, it's because you're affecting a smaller area, so you're trying to be more what's yeah. it, robust in what you do. Whereas yeah, now, sure. you're focusing on one small area, which is only a maximum of, what, 10,000 people? Whereas you've mm -hmm. got a county which is over 100,000 people. That you're going yeah. to so the politics gets dispersed between the areas, between the wards, rather than focused deliberately on the ward. But yeah. you mentioned you were stood as a Conservative at the last election and was elected as that. Um, you since then have become an independent what was the reasoning behind leaving the Conservative yeah, so, party um yeah so this is a variety of reasons and this is probably not publicly known but i'm happy to make it public it's, it's not a secret in any way but so a, a variety of reasons really i was elected as a conservative in pentrisk in um 20, may 2017 wasn't it yeah. and um to be honest with you it was probably because I'm quite well known in Pembrisk area, you know, my family is um, uh, a well known family in the area, not necessarily because I'm, um, I was a Conservative. Um, and in 2017, you, you'll be aware that um, there was a lot of, um, well, uh, you know, political um, issue around Brexit and the Prime Minister David Cameron at the time um, essentially had to uh, leave office and Theresa May took over and she wanted to seek a new mandate and I suppose as a result of me standing um, as the 2011 Assembly candidate against the, the then First Minister Calvin Jones um, I'd 
gained a profile within the um, associate, the Conservative Association. Uh, I probably was the preferred candidate from the members to take on that election against Madeleine Moon, who was the sitting MP at the time. Um, and um, essentially, um, I suppose from the establishment, I'm seen as uh, establishment within any political party. This is, you know, you 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 know this if you become a member of a political party. There's what the establishment think and what the um, the normal members think. Yeah. So basically, I, I my gut feeling is is that they thought that I was a member of the awkward squad essentially. So you know, I'm not. I don't tend to be one that follows a whip um, easily. Um, I probably challenge things where I feel that 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 is wrong. I, I, I would have my own mind in Parliament. Uh, so at that very sensitive period of time surrounding Brexit, uh, I probably wouldn't necessarily support the party line. So they didn't want someone in a potentially winnable uh, position at that time. I know the agenda is a, um, is a key seat for, uh, the key battleground seat for the Labour Party and the Conservatives, as we've known from recent history. So um, therefore, I suppose it was manufactured the situation a situation was manufactured where uh, it, i was told or the official reason was that they wanted more women more women in parliament so um as a result i was overlooked um because of based on gender essentially um and my principle are that regardless of gender or sexuality or any other um, defining feature, um, you should be elected based on merit and merit yeah. alone. So, you know, you know, I could have been selected, there could have been a rule put in place, a manufactured rule, where I could have been selected as a gay man, for example. That wasn't the case. It was, you know, you're dismissed because you're male. Um, so not only was um, the decision to put that uh, in place um, a matter of principle for me, because don't forget, you know, I was quite a senior member of the Bridgend Conservative team at that point. I was uh, chair of the Education uh, Scrutiny Committee in um, Bridgend. Um, and essentially, it was a personal slap in the face as well for me. I mustn't yeah. um, dismiss that. So it was based on principles of merit and a, and a personal slap in the face for me that after well over a decade of building the Conservative Association within the Bridgend County Borough, they decided to do that to someone who was very loyal. Interestingly, you know, when the current MP for Bridgend sought office, the preference for female candidates was dropped. So, you know, that tells you enough, I suppose. So that's that's the kind of background that that, that led to my um, becoming of independent. Uh, but I suppose, you know, beyond that, uh, it would have happened anyway, I would, I would have said. And I suppose in retrospect, I can say that, but it would have happened anyway. I, I'm not, I wouldn't have been a supporter of Brexit. I, I'm not, I'm not a su particular supporter of Boris Johnson's way of governing. So, you know, even if I were to have become the Member of Parliament, a or Conservative Member of Parliament with the agenda, at some point, I think that my like, uh, uh, loyal to the Conservatives would have uh, slipped in the end. So you stood for Parliament before against Madeleine Moon? I stood no. I stood. Um, I stood uh, against Calvin Jones, first minister. Oh, Calvin Jones. Sorry. Um, yeah, in 2011, and I stood against Chris Elmore, who's the member of Parliament in Aldermore, when he became MP when Hiraranka Davis moved from Parliament to, to the, um, the Assembly. Yeah. So, what are your ambitions for the future? Are you going to stay a county councillor or look to stand for Parliament or even the Senate the next time round? Well. That, that's the difficult thing about being an independent, I suppose. You know, as I've just mentioned, I used to be very ambitious yeah. about seeking election to higher office. Um, however, I think until the election system changes demonstrably to become more proportional, you know, such as, I don't know, single transferable vote or something like that, there's very little opportunity for any independents to get elected unless it's based on a single issue campaign. So some independents have got elected before them as MPs, but it's always like saving a hospital or saving a school or on, on a single issue basis. 
they don't really gain any ground, like we've seen in the recent Senate elections. Um, even though, for example, Steve Blatter did very well in Bridgend, he, yeah. he gained a significant number of votes. He was still way off the, the, the number of votes which were required. If we had a more proportional system, then potentially Steve or anybody, any other candidate for that matter, um, would have a chance of actually gaining public office. And also, you know, I, I really do think that the way in which political parties have their regional lists is farcical. Uh, essentially, they uh, elevate candidates um, who they who, who they like, basically, and not not based on merit again. So the um, the the electorate have very little say in who who their regional uh, members of the Senate are. Uh, so a lot of work needs to be done, I think, in the way in which our electoral system uh, allows independent candidates just to uh, represent the communities at a higher level. Yeah. Excuse me a second. I'm losing my light badly. I'm going to turn my light on. It's just starting to really pour down where I am. OK, no problem. I know not much to look at, but I like to see what I'm doing. <laughs> um, yeah, so you've. I think another problem for an independent standing is that they have to fund everything themselves from yeah. that getting people to help them. Whereas a party candidate has a huge advantage. They don't have to find the money to do their own leaflets. Party will pay for that party will also send out flyers that mention them in the local area so it doesn't come under party funding it doesn't come under election funding and i think until that changes as well until it makes an even ground it's going to be hard for an independent on any issue even saving a hospital saving your local park or whatever it is very hard not just for parliament but for the senate as well even though we ha i believe we've had an independent senate at the moment i'm not really sure but there we go anyway we've got questions yeah i don't i don't know i think but i think you're absolutely right you know it's about financial resources which political parties provide it's um, human resources on the on the doorsteps um it's um an association with um uh with a group and a uh, a political platform which people can uh, associate with uh so it's going to be incredibly difficult for um, independent candidates to cut through that at a national level. Um, at county level, it's much easier because you have a much smaller area to deal with, and and the, and the public tend to know the people around them. You know, they um, if you're if you're doing your job properly, I suppose, then most people know who you are in your area because you've done something within the community. Whereas, I suppose, on a much larger scale, then it's more difficult to cut through as an independent and unknown independent in those areas. So I think you're absolutely right. The electoral system needs to change on a, uh, not only on the, um, in terms of the way in which people vote, as, a, as I said, not first past the post, but perhaps a single transferable vote system, but uh, the way in which, um, you know, way in which uh, uh, politics is funded and resourced. Yeah. You're right, you're right though. The rain, the, rain, the rain is hammering down now, so it's difficult to uh, concentrate, isn't it? Yes, well, <laughs> since I moved from, uh, well, since I was elected for Lichard, um, I actually <laughs> moved since then. I'm actually living up in Cummer and looking to come back in the next two months. Okay. Because, because my tenancy is coming up on where I live. But um, it, I live in a valley, so we always get rain. It's ha absolutely hammering it out there. It's just, just started here in Fankoid as well, so you're not on your own. No. Yeah. Anyway, I've got a question from a member of the public. Um, okay. It is, you have represented all three wards on Pencoy Town Council at some point over the last decade and more. Why did you leave Pencoy Town Council and do you ev ever have any intention of returning? I think you mentioned why you left, because you lost your seat, wasn't it? Um, no, no, I didn't. No, I didn't lose my seat on Pencoy Town Council. Oh. Um, but the reason is a similar reason for leaving the Conservative Party. Um, and it wasn't a personal slap in the face, but it was a question of meritocracy. So there's a massive lack of meritocracy in politics, which needs to be addressed wholesale. Now, as you said, I've represented all three wards in Pencoid on Pencoid Town Council. And 
at the time, I think it was 2018, 19, I think this was, although I may be wrong, no, I think it was, I was deputy mayor of Penkhoid at the time. So the normal progression is that you become mayor the following year. And this was when I resigned my position. So it was a big deal for me, a really big decision, because I would have been mayor of my hometown. Uh, and I'm sure you'll agree that this would have been a great honour. You know, it's a great honour for somebody to become mayor of their, and basically the, um, you know, the lead, the leader of their uh, their hometown, or, or certainly in, um, um, uh, to 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 actually represent your town like that is a is a great honour. So when there was a by-election cause, um, as a result of I believe a sad uh, death of one of our councillors, um, an election wasn't called. So uh, for people who are watching this who don't know what the state of play is then, it allows existing town and community councillors, wherever they are, to co-opt to adopt someone of their choice onto that council. So at this stage, and I was, I was the deputy mayor and, and a member of that council at the time, there were four applicants. So essentially they put in the applic application a bit like a job application, CV, etc. And all of these candidates were supposed to be considered based on merit. And it is my opinion in this case that this wasn't the case when co-opting a successful candidate. So, as a result, the majority party on Penkoy Town, Town Council was and still is the Labour Party. Uh, but regardless of party, I would still have said the same if any other party had, had done the same. Guess what? The only candidate considered and adopted onto the council was the only Labour Party candidate. Now, this is not based on merit. In fact, none of the other applications which we had on that evening were considered whatsoever. So I thought this was absolutely disgusting. So this resulted in me uh, calling Penkoy Town Council a kangaroo court and um, all of this. I was referred to the Public Services Ombudsman as a result. Um, I resigned as deputy mayor, I resigned as a councillor, and as, re as a result, um, to cut a long story short, I have absolutely no intention of seeking re-election to Pencoy Town Council until such time as the people on that council change, uh, and until such time as this party politics, which I mentioned earlier on, at this level, the local government is totally extinguished, because not only do this, does this particular town council not engage with the local community in my view? I think it needs to change and this party politics needs to be you know, very a very low priority and the community needs to be at the very heart of uh, their decision-making process. I think that's true with any level of government, but more so at community council and county council because it has immediate effect it has an overwhelming effect more so than national politics or senate politics yeah so you know so um, this decision was solely based on merit it had nothing to do with personal um the my, my personal position because actually on this occasion it was actually doing me out of a personal uh, achievement in that i was deputy mayor at the time so whereas you can say you know you could argue that how oh, I resigned and threw my teddies out the pram because I didn't um, become the um, candidate for, um, uh, for the Conservative Party, which I suppose you know that's a legitimate uh, opinion to take. Although it was based, it was a decision based on principle as well. In this particular case, it was solely because the other people who I thought had greater merit for the position um, weren't considered, and I thought that was um, a real shame and and you know quite um, disgusting, really, of, of my fellow colleagues to solely um, elect someone based on um, political party affiliation. So would you say this is another system that needs to change in a way, like the electoral system, that if somebody doesn't call an election for a vacant seat on a town council, which does cost the council money, as yeah, we all know, to hold no, the election. There's a, there's a vacancy now in Pembrisk for town council. Yeah. Uh, as a result of Luke Fletcher, a uh, member of the Senate, um, being elevated to his uh, position in the Senate, um, there was a choice to just let it slide. However, I've encouraged members of the public to exercise their democratic right and ensure that there is an, an election uh, because of this very reason. Now, 
even though it does cost three thousand four thousand pounds to host um, to hold an election uh, here in uh, Pemprisk for the forthcoming election and I suppose there is an argument to say that our elections next year you know is co-option of another Labour Party candidate um, and I say that as Labour, the Labour Party because that's the situation here in Pencoid at the moment However, I would say exactly the same if it were the Conservative Party as the majority party in another area in, in, um, in the county borough. So I'm not having to go with the Labour Party. I'm just saying this is what the situation is here, here in Pencoid. I just want the candidate who the electorate choose to represent them, not someone who is elevated to that position based on party political affiliation. Hmm. And I'd just like to point out that councils don't have to find the money for the election in the budget because they have to put some aside for in case an election is called for whatever reason yeah. anyway. So there, the money is set aside. Whether they use it every year or not is a different matter, but there is money that is automatically set aside in every budget that should be there every year. So yeah. we'll get on to you as a county councillor now and could you just take us through a little bit of what you do on a daily basis as a county councillor because I know it's quite a mystery people just think they come out with blurbs and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and just deal with rubbish complaints all the time really <laughs> that it's not been picked up or anything but well, sometimes you do yeah yeah well a lot of I, I understand a lot of times at the moment with covid and everything it does it's not the waste department's fault it's not Keir's fault they have to abide by the rules and if people test positive COVID, they're going to have to self-isolate or if they've been near somebody with COVID, they're going to have to self-isolate at the moment. So it does stretch departments a bit thinner at the moment. And there's a lot of patience in the county. I, I agree with that. And it's good to remind that your rubbish hasn't been picked up. But yeah. Don't... Well, no, shall I shall I just outline what the sort of role as a, of a county councillor is? Is that would yep. that be helpful? Yep. Um... Yeah. So, essentially, you know, th th there is a little bit of a mis misunderstanding amongst the public that sometimes we are seen as advocates for the county council. Now, I'm always keen to stress when I'm speaking to the public, like for example, in public meetings which I recently held about the local development plan, etc., that we are not spokespeople for the County Borough Council. In fact, it's the reverse. We are spokespeople for you, the residents. Uh, so we try to represent our constituents' interests to the best of our ability. Uh, we make referrals um, in writing to um, BCBC officers on a whole range of issues from, as you say, waste collection, potholes, um, it's a whole range of services that BCBC deal with, from you know social services issues, uh, which I one, one of which I dealt with yesterday, educational issues, um, housing, um, a whole lot more. I could go on with the, um, the areas which BCBC cover. Um, but uh, beyond that, we also have a role then uh, in sitting on a wide variety of committees. Um, so we don't just sit at home waiting for a phone call or an email um, or a Facebook message from constituents uh, complaining about their pothole or waste collection. We sit on a, a variety of scrutiny committees. There are three in um, Bridgend, three main ones anyway. There's, there's also another one which deals with corporate issues, but three main ones. One which um, mainly deals with education, when, one which mainly deals with social services, and then the other which deals with communities issues, which are probably the most visible things which uh, everyone sees yeah. in, their, in, their, in their community. So we, we examine different policies, we question cabinet members, and then uh, other than that, there are some uh, quasi-judicial committees, uh, such as licensing, so they deal with perhaps taxi licenses or uh, uh, pub licenses, etc., and planning, of course, you know, uh, planning for development, yeah. um, and housing and then there's also the audit committee which deals with corporate affairs risk and financial um, financial affairs as well mm. so as i said um, all of this is based on political balance um, roughly half i suppose it's, it's almost half uh, are labor party members because they are the minority um, ad administration i think they've got 25 out of 54 councillors so they they are, occupy almost half the seats in all of these committees yeah. And then the other uh, committees are um, 
uh, basically uh, distributed on political balance. And um, over my time as uh, a county councillor, uh, I, um, as I mentioned, I think earlier on, I've chaired the education committee, I've chaired the audit committee as well, and now uh, I'm leader of the largest opposition group. Okay. So I know people think, and even before I got into being a community councillor, that people think that councillors just sit, wait around, like you said, but how many hours a week do you put into the work you do at the council, helping residents, going out and even just meeting people? Do yeah. You have a number of... So I suppose, this, I suppose this varies. Um, it depends how how visible and you know, varies per councillor, to be honest with you. Um, you know, those people who are perhaps most active, um, I won't name them on camera, but everyone knows perhaps who they are on the council. In every single group, there are more, more people who are more, act more active than others. Um, so the time spent varies per councillor. Um, I hope that people in my area think that I'm quite proactive in, in putting myself out there on social media and in the community. So as a result, you sort of tend to generate your own workload. Yeah. Um, so, you know, meeting constituents and actively seeking out work is bound to result in um, more work. I would say um, I probably do more work now because I'm leader of the opposition and I have to attend more meetings. Uh, but I would say perhaps two to three hours a day. Um, it's not considered um, a professional job. And I think uh, some, some constituents and some residents out there probably think that this is my professional, this is my job. Now, it isn't my job. It's something which it, it is, you know, at county level, it is remunerated, whereas obviously town and community council um, largely isn't. I think you just I think nowadays you, can, you perhaps get um, a, a small um, a small stipend as it every year if you wish to take it at town yeah. and community council level. But uh, uh, county council, I guess, I think just over £13,000 per annum. So it's not a, it's not considered a full time role. It's considered a, um, a part time, largely voluntary role. Um, and then if you get a senior salary, such as myself as leader of the opposition or a scrutiny chair, then they will get um, additional um, additional to cover the extra work. But it's, yeah. it's not considered as a full time job. That's great. Um, next, we have another question from a member of the public. <laughs> and this is going to be a good one. What do you like, hate, and loathe about being a councillor? Um, well, obviously, I think the vast majority of my colleagues and I would say that the reason why we go into the job is to give something back to the community which you love and live, and live in and have probably... Uh, been born and bred in. So what I enjoy about it is that we are able to make a difference to members of the public. Um, and that's, that's very clear because clearly the role of council is to facilitate results on behalf of the public. That's, you know, very, very important. And it's very rewarding then when you do actually get results, you know, um, and actually make a difference for families. You know, some, some families are, you know, absolutely delighted when they get, um, Especially in you know in, in areas such as social services and education, um, you know, people don't you know sort of cry, cry in the middle of the street when their pothole is fixed, but they certainly do when you know you, you solve their housing needs or social services or educational needs. Um, so yeah, that that's what I love about it really is and and what is most rewarding. Um, what I hate, I um, hate and loathe are similar, I suppose. Um, it's difficult, as I suppose. I, I hate being talked at during meetings, to be honest with you, uh, by officers. Um, it means that we're not really genuinely, we as councillors now, are not really genuinely able to contribute to the meeting. We end up being observers. So, you know, we all we all receive these sort of packs of papers, um, which run into the 300 pages. Um, before meetings. One example was like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a five and a half hour meeting uh, to, uh, to discuss actually the waste collection contract. Um, and then for officers to spend the best part of two hours talking through the same 
papers is absolutely mind-numbing, to be honest with you. And what I've said to the leader and others is that if I were them, save your time, you know, I would say, you've all received the comprehensive brief in, by, in writing. Are there any questions? And you know, this would allow councillors more time to debate and provide more input. I think I and my fellow lead, leaders of the opposition in all groups are a little bit frustrated that we can't actually have more time to debate the issues which are relevant to the public. And we are merely presented with recommendations which we have to note or to approve or even to vote upon. Um, but very little changes compared to what the recommendations are from the senior officers. So I think generally that's what I loathe about it, is that are we there just to spare parts? Are we there just to nod things through as in the democratic process? Or are we actually there to meaningfully contribute our residents' views? So that's something that I would I would really like to change. So that that's your biggest pet peeve about it is yeah, that's, you, that's you, my, you just that's my real plug there. Somebody, somebody just to rubber stamp things and that's it. So well, yeah, that, that's what I that's what I loathe about it. And I don't think we're there. Nobody, nobody in my position, my colleagues on all sides would say we w we want to play a meaningful role here. So let let us do it. And you know, I know some colleagues who have said I don't even bother reading the papers anymore because I know I'm going to be presented to, uh, with them anyway. No, that's wrong, isn't it? Because you ought to read your packs. There may be things in there which are not necessarily said by the officer. So, you know, if the officer doesn't um, present it, then it, it'll give the opportunity for people to read things in detail, make their own notes and contribute in, in a meaningful way. So, you know, one example, it wasn't regarding um, a, a presentation or a report which was, which was presented, but it was, the, it was the quarterly debates which have been introduced. I don't know whether anybody watched, watched the first one, but it was on educational issues, you know, and it was a very broad subject. It was post-COVID education, educational challenges or something like that. Now, I uh, contributed on, I think, Welsh language education uh, and other colleagues contributed on school capacity issues and um, special educational needs, etc. You know, there wasn't a meaningful debate. They were just pre-prepared um, you know, contributions. I, I don't really want that in a debate. I want, you know, someone intervening on me. I want something meaningful coming from a debate. You know, challenges are from across the floor. Let's have something which is more, you know, spicy rather than stilted. Oh. Perhaps, perhaps that's just me. <laughs> well, no, I, I can see the point. What's the point of people just getting oh this is what we're going to do just rubber stamp it you get no debate you don't get even the best outcome in the end because okay you've got people in the council that are paid to do the job and they're paid very well to do their job and they're experts in the field but even the simplest person can come up with an idea that somebody else hasn't thought of that may make something better so unless you have debate nothing is everything's just going to stay the same and yeah, and you know, it, it might be the best option, but let's challenge it. Uh, let's have more time to challenge as well. You know, the, we've all we've all received the papers. We've all received the recommendations. Thank you very much for putting so much effort into providing us with the papers. But then, after that, hand it over to the councillors to challenge that and answer questions. Don't don't just speak at us for two hours. You know, it, it does really annoy me, and I know it annoys many other colleagues. So that needs to change. Okay, you've worked on both community and county councils. What are the differences and which do you find most rewarding? Yeah, so I think I've, we've covered uh, this a little bit already, yeah. but um, no question county council is more rewarding for me. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, you can genuinely make a difference uh, at county council level. Look, the fact of the matter is, is that most decisions are made at this level of local government. Um, maybe on larger town councils with larger budgets, there are things which you can do at town and community level, such as local events, community projects, which you can uh, look at. But they're usually limited to a relatively small amount of money which they can devote to it. Yeah. You know, in comparison to the millions and millions of pounds which the county council are responsible for. So, yeah, no question county level. Uh, perhaps I'm... A little bit disillusioned by my experience at town and community council level so you know, I'm, ha I'm happy for people to 
you know, divide, challenge, you know, pre- you should challenge that, dis- yeah. disagree with me on that if you, if, if you wish to do so. But um, no, for me, I find it far more rewarding in actually being able to get results for people. As I mentioned, that that, that is the most rewarding thing. So um, I think it's it's, it's quite, quite frustrating at town and community council level, potentially, that you don't have more powers. You know, it may be the case in some regards that it, some community project should be devolved further down to yeah. the town and community level. But also the funding would have to go with it, go with that then as well. Yes. Um, yeah, a lot, especially, I think, no, with the sports field, with the delayed increase again of the pitch fees and that, I, they're looking for more town and community councils, clubs to take over these facilities. But yeah. In the short term, with a small bit of funding, that's okay. But they've got to think about long term. How are they going to keep up with these costs? It's the same as Bridgend, but they've got tighter budgets on community councils to do that. Next, what is happening in Pemprisk at the moment that's got you any concern or that's actually good for the area? Well, Pemprisk is a relatively residential area, as you probably know. Um, I suppose my area uh, covers the northern third of Pencroyd and then also covers the rural area of Hila Q um, and Rookie Log. Um, so there are different challenges in different communities. Um, there isn't anything, I suppose, specific coming up in the next year um, compared to other years. It's the same old issues which I've described already. Uh, but I have raised one issue uh, in council recently regarding school capacity issues, which is causing some concern uh, with my constituents here in Pembrisk. And that is, first of all, I don't believe the Pencoy Primary School, which is actually one of the biggest primary schools in the borough, was built big enough. So that's going to cause an issue um, for potential uh, school um, access in the future. But another specific concern which I raised recently is school capacity issues for Welsh language medium education for people in Pencoid. Mm. So um, it means that somebody who wants to access um, Welsh medium education has to be either bus or taxi all the way across the county borough to my stag or all the way across the county borough to North Canelli to access Welsh medium education. So what I've mentioned is that that needs to be addressed through the school catchment areas. Now, that, that is just one very specific point uh, for, for Pemprisk. But apart from that, um, it's the same old things. You know, there are a few planning um, uh, issues which are causing concern with the, within the area. But other than that, it's the general um, issues of, as I say, waste collection, uh, potholes, um, social services and educational issues, which I mentioned earlier. Um, going on to planning, uh, we've just had the consultation for the local development plan end in the last few days and it won't be announced for at least another year which is after the elections. Are there any concerns within that LDP that have been brought up to your attention in regards to Pemprisk area? Um, yes, and I suppose I'll answer this question in terms of Pencroyd as a whole, if I may, because yeah. after the next election, um, you, you, you'll be aware that the Boundary Commission has suggested some changes and Pemprys won't, will, will cease to exist as a, as a ward um, at the next election. There'll be a three-member ward for the whole of Pencroyd. So I've submitted representations to the draft local development plan on the basis of it being the whole of Pencroyd. Um, there is one, one specific issue regarding Penprisk, and that's the new Penprisk Road Bridge. At the moment, um, there's a set of light, uh, traffic lights um, in the centre of Pencoid, um, which is essentially a one-way road bridge, which links the west and east of the town. And uh, there are plans, uh, then that goes over the railway, and there are plans to make that a dual bridge. Um, and therefore it will lift the current planning moratorium on development in the west of the town. So that could be significant uh, in that uh, potentially uh, developments could occur uh, to, to the west of the town in the ward of Hendra and in the ward of Penprisk. So that's, that's something to keep an eye on. Um, residents are probably 
uh, wary of that given the tra traffic access issues on Hendra Road um, and the you know the lack of um, I suppose available land for development however the local authority have said that there isn't any uh, prospect of development past this plan period so that's after 2033 so I know that's a bit of response so people might not be able to get their heads around it but as far as I'm, I'm aware the planning moratorium will still exist regardless of whether the new road bridge um, is improved this will result in the closure of the level crossing in Pencoy. So the, um, the railway line runs through the very centre, the main line between Swansea and London, um, runs right through the centre of Pencoy. So this will mean the closure of the level crossing. So everyone would have to use the Penfrisk Road Bridge then to access the west of Pencoy. Now, I welcome this to a certain extent because it opens up development opportunities for the very centre of Pencoy then. It creates a nice square, a center, centerpiece of, uh, for Pencoid around uh, the cenotaph, the, the, what's, what's commonly known as the, the monument here. Um, it, it would be uh, good, for this, good for the town center. How, however, it's, it's something uh, that we need to watch and uh, the widen, widening of Hendra Road to accommodate extra traffic is important. The other thing I suppose briefly uh, is the development or the, the proposed development of 770 houses to the east of Pencoid. Now, Pencoid is considered um, as a place which could be uh, an area of sustainable development, employment opportunities, um, somewhere which is accessible because it's close to the M4 and it links very well with Cardiff and Swansea. I recognise that. However, if you're going to build 770 houses to the east of Pencoid, Pencoid needs the facilities to be able to accommodate those additional houses. So those are the kinds of things which need to be addressed um, in the draft of the plan. Um, those are the, in, in short, those are the issues which I've raised. So I'm hoping that the developers and the planners will take that into consideration by the time the LDP is uh, finally published. That's great. It sounds like there's a lot going on for the future, especially in the next... 11 years with the LDP coming up um, but that brings on an issue with regards to planning um, that I've seen with planning it's the objection part of the planning where public object to something as we've seen with the wellness centre in Bridgend and Tondi they had record numbers of objections and they were totally ignored what's the point of objecting public objecting to something in Tondi, they had three community councils, a Senate member, county councillors objecting to it, but all totally ignored because it was in the LDP and it would be granted an appeal anyway. So what is the point of having somebody object when it doesn't make a blind bit of difference? It means nothing at all anyway. Yeah, I, I sympathise with residents on this, to be honest with you. Um, and I think that planning law needs to be reformed wholesale. Now, yeah. this wouldn't be a matter for obviously local government in isolation. It would have to be done by Welsh government. Yeah. Um, there's a massive amount of frustration, isn't there, uh, about planning law. Um, you know, I suppose with regards to the wellness centre, I'm not totally familiar with the situation there, but with regards to any planning issue, um, my understanding is that objections need to be based on the on what's called material planning considerations and you can't just object just because you don't like something somewhere it can't be sort of not in not in my backyard yeah. you know, um, that's fine but you know the chances are if 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 so many people objected that they would have material planning considerations so you know i do feel the residents frustration i do feel residents frustrations there uh, I, I, now in in, in in my view you know I don't. I also don't believe people generally should be able to proceed with developments and then seek retrospective planning permission. This has always been a bugbear of mine. You know, and uh, people's objections then should be given far more weight. You know, people start building. You know, I got one in 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 my uh, ward now of from which um, the people have start people have built something uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, it's been 
taken to the planning inspectorate because you know, it didn't gain planning permission. And ultimately, they can just put planning permission in re retrospectively. Now, this is farcical, isn't it? Because yeah. ultimately, if, you know, if planning enforcement ultimately win the case at planning inspectorate level, then potentially these people could just leave the land and not uh, restore it to its original state. Now, this is, you know, really poor, isn't it, for local residents in the area who well, want their community to be preserved. So, but, no, so, but I sympathise, therefore, with BCBC and the planning officers who have to deal with this on a daily basis. You know, planning enforcement seem powerless in some respects to enforce breaches of planning conditions. Um, and essentially, people need, people, I suppose, like me uh, and others, um, and, you know, at cabinet level, need to lobby uh, the local government minister to reform planning law wholesale uh, so that it addresses some of the issues which you raised. Yeah, I, I think I do sympathise with planning officers on that because essentially they have to follow the law, not feelings, unfortunately. But then it does go to a vote of the planning committee of whether it gets approved or not. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Yeah, but, that's right, yeah. Um, it's like, I, rem I remember, Tom D, because I was part of the objections at the time and the council officers at the time, the head of the planning um, in the meeting said clearly, under the law, we have to, ex there is no reason why this can't go through. But if you do object to it, I can't be part of the process further on the line. Now, my understanding is he works for the council, regardless of whether he likes what they do or agrees or disagrees, he still has, works for council. And if council reject it, he should be working on their behalf to find the reasons why this shouldn't go ahead or to say, well, this has so much public objection. In the wellness village, they have public objection with the traffic situation, which Park Street has already got a traffic order on it with the pollution. So a wellness centre with more visitors is going to create more traffic. So I can I can see that there are reasons for objection. I don't agree with not in my backyard. It's, I, I, I don't agree with that. Um, but I do agree if there are practical reasons like the air pollution on Park Street, which is going to feed into the wellness village, like the woods at Tom D where there are rare species that live there, but they couldn't find any because they went out of the season of when the rare species would be there, then I do think the objections are there for council employees to say, this is the reason why people objected. This is overwhelmingly people don't want this, regardless the majority of people in the area don't want this. It's not a case of not in my backyard, they've been burnt by other developments, which was part of the reason mm -hmm. Tom D, because they had the retail park, they were promised a medical centre and ended up getting a retail park and they didn't want that happening again. So that was part of the reason for objecting. But I, I, I just think council employees work for council, they should do as they're directed, as long as it's not breaking the law in any way, that they should take the respect of the councillors because they're the ones elected in positions to make those decisions regardless of whether they disagree or agree sorry that's my little rant. yeah no i, I think you, i think you're absolutely right uh, but you know we we do have the opportunity to send issues such as this to committee we do have the opportunity i don't sit on planning committee any longer but for example on a number of occasions um where there have been objections to planning um de developments in my particular ward you can request an opportunity to speak you know it is a big deal if the planning committee go against officers recommendations it's rare uh, they can do um you know so i suppose it's up to members of planning mm -hmm. but the you, you make a good point in, in, in the planning law at the moment is heavily weighted in favour of the applicant rather than the objectors or the residents in the surrounding area. Yeah. So, you know, as I said in my original remarks, planning law wholesale needs, you know, massive reform. Massive reform. Okay. This is a personal one for you. It's, if you're allowed to introduce one policy 
that is automatically accepted by the whole council that would benefit the whole county, what would it be? Um, I'll speak broadly rather than um, rather than in specifics, yeah. because, um, because I think every look. If I were, if I were to become leader of the council next year then this would probably be the first thing I would do because everything else I think flows from this yeah in my in my views it might not be very popular because nobody likes sort of outsourcing or consultants or you know independent people coming in and interfering with organizations but what I would do to be honest with you is the organizations massive organizations such as county councils need to be a little bit more self-reflective now you know i don't believe that bcbc's public image is particularly well regarded is it you know you, you've got to admit it's not a particularly well regarded organization it hasn't for a, a number of years now many problems have cropped up various no. parties in charge no. but many yeah absolutely and, and that's that's absolutely true um but regardless of political parties, the officers are the same, and we've got some fantastic officers. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but we've got some poor, poor officers as well, to be honest with you. And that isn't to underestimate how much pressure they've been under over the last year and a half. There's been a great deal of pressure on departments during the pandemic. Um, however, from a councillor's perspective, we face massive reputational damage um, because we're on the front line. Um, no, we're not advocates for the council and spokespeople for the council, as I mentioned in my yeah. opening remarks, but we are seen as representatives of BCBC. There's a massive amount of good work which is done at BCBC, um, to, but that needs to be communicated to residents effectively. But I, what I would do is have take, t take a step back and undertake some internal challenge um, of the Gen County Borough Council's performance rather than resort to defending their record. Yeah. So the administration, what I would do immediately is for any in incoming administration to be far more self-reflective, uh, challenge the way they do things. Um, you know, there are massive challenges with our waste contract, massive challenges with our tight budget, um, which, and, and the, the in, spe in uh, specific terms that that comes down to um, things like home to school transport, adult social services. Um, there, are, there are challenges in housing as well. Um, so what I would do is the policy, going back to the, the original question, <laughs> is immediately commission an independent organization to come in to look at it so that we can become a far more efficient organization, which therefore over the term, now we'll look at this over the term of the whole council, which ultimately improves the performance of the delivery of, of yeah. very key services within our council. Everything flows from this. Now, people will say, well, how much is this gonna cost bringing in a, a massively overpaid consultant to come in or consultancy firm to come in and look at our, uh, the way in which we do things? Can't we do it ourselves? Well, the answer is no, you can't do it yourselves because you're criticizing yourself. So you end up being defensive of your own policy rather than actually genuinely um, reflective and um, a critical friend, if you like. And a lot of these organizations, I know from personal experience, from other um, professional, other professional life, they don't charge you upfront. They take their fee from what you save. So um, it's a case of, I suppose, bringing a totally fresh pair of eyes to provide recommendations um, which would improve the performance uh, you know, over the course of a whole administration. Uh, and then we could deploy their recommendations, which would result in improvement in reputa uh, reputation, um, the best performing council in the whole of Wales, that's my ambition, uh, and then a great reputation um, among its residents for the very important public services which it provides. So that's what that's what I would do. It sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer in saying what policy would you introduce? Um, because perhaps you want a, a specific answer, that, you know, like, I don't know, bring uh, waste services in-house or something. But I think generally in how we improve services across the board, 
we do really need to genuinely take a self-reflective uh, look at the services we run, the performance of the local authority across the board. Uh, that, that is a good answer. I, I wasn't looking for, oh, we'll all have a bank holiday on this day every year or something <laughs> like that. I, I was looking for the more substantive like that. that if you don't reflect on what you've done, you can't see what you've done right or wrong. And you can't do that yourself. You have to have somebody objective look at it. You can't say... Oh, I, I, I believe so. And it's not, it's not just, you know, for me, it's not just changing an administration. Say there would be a fresh administration next year led by a, a potential coalition. Mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, you can't do it yourself as politicians. Right. You, because, and you, you're going to rely on the officers who are the same officers who, who were there from the last administration to um, to, to look at themselves. Yeah. And I think they're just going to be, you know, it's a hu it's human nature. I'm not, not criticizing them. You're going to back yourself, aren't you? You're going to say, well, no, we've done as much as we possibly can here. So yeah. you need a genuinely fresh pair of eyes to look at it and say, well, you can do this better. You're not, you're doing well in this area. Great. You're, you're not doing so well here. Yeah, um, that, that, it, that's what I do. I think it would be, I think it would be money well spent, uh, and it would improve services in every single directorate over the course of the whole administration. Something which is not short and sharp, but something which actually improves um, all of our services. Yeah, as, as a slow build, and if you can, then you get the independent report, and it says this area is doing fantastically, and it's overachieving what it should and it's got too many resources but this area's losing out and they're not they're struggling to cope with what they've got to do you can adjust those resources but if you look at it yourself everybody's going to say in whatever department they are oh no i haven't got enough anymore or we, whatever it is because you always want more you want to make life easier f for yourself and that's where an independent outside organization looking in would be the best solution it, no, and, it, I, and I don't, I don't underestimate the the um, criticism which any administration no. would have if they were to do that, uh, because people would say, well, you shouldn't be spending money on an a, a external consultant. You shouldn't be outsourcing to a massively overpaid consultant. Um, uh, you should be investing in schools and um, uh, and social services, etc. However, what I'm the point I'm trying to make is that we would actually, over the course of the whole administration. Um, be able to perform better in these areas as a result of bringing them in. So sometimes you need to take really tough decisions like that to make the whole organization perform better in the long run. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. All right, we're on to our last question now, and I thought I'd save this for last. Uh, from from a resident of Pemprisk, um, okay. who is your favorite resident? <laughs> That, that, Who's my favourite resident? That was the is, answer I got. That, and I'm not allowed to let you say your mum. You, you're not allowed to say my mother. I was <laughs> told you're not allowed to say your mother. Oh. <laughs> I, oh. I did, did reply back. What boy isn't going to say his mother? <laughs> but... I know. I don't know. My dog, my dog, I suppose. He's, he's right here now. No, I can't say that. I bet that's from Louise, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Louise, Louise Dixon then. Uh, Louise Dixon. Right Does she also fall within the second question, which is, who is your worst resident? <laughs> I can't say my mother for that. Mate. No. <laughs> Louise again. Yeah, Louise Dixon. Louise Dixon as well. She's a hassle. Uh, she's like Marmite. Like you love her or hate her, depending on the day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> that is all the questions i've got uh alex thank you very much for doing this and i will my get pleasure up as soon as possible thank you very much okay thank no you. problem at all take care thank you goodbye bye bye